Uh, my name is Troy Denton and I work with VoIP and telephony stuff uh, as basically my primary job function. That doesn't really mean I'm that good at it, but I can show you guys a thing that's report to you on how to set up your own systems. Uh, we'll be discussing free switch today. I called it a VoIP super server because it's hard to give it any one name. It can do a lot of things and people use it for a lot of different purposes. So I'll call it a super server. Um, you know a presentation is going to be weird when it starts with a legal disclaimer. You could do a lot of really bad things with this knowledge that could land you in legal or financial trouble. So I cannot accept any liability for any crazy ideas you actualize. Uh, the most important of which, if you configure your PBX on the cloud like I'm very foolishly about to do to show you guys, you could be subject to toll fraud and could bankrupt yourself very quickly. So be careful and uh, exercise caution in all your production servers. Case in point, if you actually use Les's services, though, he actually monitors that and would walk. He actually could account like that. The account. That is good to know. That is really good to know. Uh, some of the topics we'll be covering today, and hopefully more if we have time. I'm shooting for 45 minutes. I haven't practiced this, so I have no idea how long it'll take. Uh, basic introduction and installation of free switch on a live system. Uh, basic administration and configuration of free switch. Configuring ITSP integration, that's Internet Telephony Service Provider, or less.net in my specific case, is I'll be... I'll be showing you how to use his services. Configuring an IVR, so if you call a Walmart and it says press one for sales, that's, that's an IVR, that's what that logic is called. And to, to make something applicable to the, the modern tech guy that doesn't have a work cell phone, we'll cover a DIY, DIY number forwarding service. Something you could set up on your own with very low risk and cost associated. Alrighty, so the ins installation takes a little while, so I'm just going to start that, do some presentation, and hopefully by the time I get back, it'll be done installing. I just want to give you guys a, a feel for how easy it is to install this. Uh, the free switch developers all develop and test and deploy on Debian, so you are well advised to use the latest Debian uh, for free switch. They, they make a big point of telling you this. I don't know why they picked Debian. It's probably That's a good reason to pick Debian. <laughs> so I'm just going to be naive and copy and paste the exact commands they tell me on a Google Cloud Platform instance I've spun up. And we'll enter the danger zone. So they do run some nice Debian repositories. Until you use them too much, they will blacklist you. I learned this the hard way. So we had configuration management installing, I don't know, like a dozen installations of FreeSwitch. And it was checking for updates every half hour across our network. And they really, really didn't like that. And they just blacklisted us without telling us. So you gotta be gotta be careful about that. It made for a really awkward interaction at a conference once. It was I probably shouldn't have brought it up at all, really. <laughs> the uh, the QoS on the mug server is probably not quite as aggressive, but uh, we do now have some some QoS, so we'll slap people who abuse us. Let's see, following signatures couldn't be verified. Public key not available. Okay, we'll just add, add this guy manually. Maybe that didn't pan out. <clears throat> Nothing like a live demo, eh? <coughs> Alrighty, so 
The main package here is FreeSwitch Meta All. And you can install it in a more fine-grained way. I don't like to tempt fate because I don't like keeping track of what everything does. So we'll just do as they suggest. About a, a cool gigabyte. There we go. Off it goes. Alrighty, back to this. Back to this. Yeah, so Debian 10 Buster, uh, they're pretty good about compatibility and like uh, reproducible builds as well. If you're into compiling it from source, it doesn't take you too long. <clears throat> you could probably find one, yeah. Uh, it's not something I've explored myself. A lot of people kind of advise against running even on virtualized hardware in a lot of cases. Uh, we still do it all the time, but if you talk to people who uh, make their living on it, they, they recommend against it. So FreeSwitch, according to their developers, it's a free and open source application server for just real-time communications. It can do WebRTC, so you can do voice calls over your web browser. You can set up plugins for that. It can do voice calls, video calls. It can do SMS messaging. You can accept and send text messages. Um, a lot of people draw parallels to Asterisk. FreeSwitch was born of the original, I don't know about original, but at least the core Asterisk developers a number of years ago, and they saw some opportunities to re-architect it in a more scalable way. So FreeSwitch, in a way, is a, a logical performance successor to Asterisk. Some of their main design goal is uh, tighter adherence to RFCs. Has anyone ever had to read an RFC to make something work? Many times. Oh, bless you boys, that's a lot of work, that's horrible. You'll, you'll do a lot of it if you work in VoIP, it's unavoidable. Um, more on that shortly. So it's an open source project and they have a commercial offshoot, a company called SignalWire, and they'll be your ITSP, they'll sell you a DID service, they'll sell you API access just like Twilio does if you want to send automated calls or messages for your production management. Uh, they offer commercial support. It's reasonable for what it is, but still pretty pricey, as well as hosted free switch solutions. And their community is actually really good. Um, all their codes on GitHub now, it used to be private, now it's all on GitHub. Their mailing list is really active and responsive. They're, they have like this weird Slack and IRC channel they've tied together some magical way. It's strange, but it's very active and I've gotten a lot of good help from there myself. <coughs> Mostly because a bunch of crusty guys at the conference say so. I really don't have a better answer than that. I wish I did. Performance or price? Usually performance. From what I hear, people who rely on Twilio hate relying on Twilio, but I've never been that person, so I can't speak to it too much. Uh, ClueCon is their annual conference. I even got a sweet t-shirt that I wore today. Look at that. Uh, I don't know why it's called ClueCon. I can never get a straight answer on that. No idea. It's a strange group of guys. It really is. Um, so it is a true-to-form like Unix, Linux program written in C. It's actually really well written if you're into C and like studying programs and modular architecture. It is up there. I really enjoyed perusing that. Writing plugins in C is pretty easy if you're already used to C, um, which is to say it's very complicated, I guess. Um, it's interesting in that its core logic relies on plugins for almost everything. Even its SIP stack, the main signaling protocol, is a plugin in their own product, which is interesting. Um, which makes it very reminiscent of loading Linux kernel modules and how those work at runtime. They leverage the Apache portable runtime, which means you can run it on anything that that supports. Um, they still really recommend Debian, so that's what we wind up using. But I suppose if you were so inclined, you could run it on Windows or various Unixes, I, I would think. Or which is way probably wouldn't give you less trouble on wanting than say you would have. Probably, yes, yeah. Uh, the configuration is from the 90s. It's all in XML. I don't know why. Because this, I don't think the software is from the 90s, but they chose XML for some reason. Whatever. It's, it's pretty good, despite this. Um, it's easy to integrate and automate things. They have a really good socket, like event-driven socket library. 
So you could even write like telnet scripts that'll get notified every time a user logs in or makes a call and you can tailor the event list and, and all this. So this is a big part of why it gets used in industry is it's very adaptable and it's, it generally makes pretty good use of the hardware it runs on. Um, that's anecdotally, again, from crusty nerds at conferences. So enough about that for now. Maybe I should introduce myself to some degree. Um, I work at 24-7 in touch as a senior telecommunications specialist. Whatever, that means whatever you want it to. I don't really know what I do. Um, I just work on stuff that's needed by clients, if that makes any sense. Uh, but that involves doing a lot of SIP and free switch installation, configuring, or configuration management, deployment, automations. Uh, we use FreeSwitch ourselves as a PBX or a private branch exchange, for those unfamiliar. We also use it for queue servers and IVR servers. So for instance, when you're waiting for an agent, your call is actually sitting like on a, on a specific queue server. It's not just some like plug-in in some other part of the program. <laughs> it's living in this weird queue server state. Uh, a PBX, by the way, if anyone is not familiar, that is like your internal phone system where you all have extensions and you can call each other by calling like 1001, 1002. That's a, that's a private branch exchange. Uh, any questions or comments so far, feel free to flag me down. I have no pride. You go right ahead. Uh, some, maybe some logic around why you might or might not use it. Uh, I found it easier to learn than asterisk. But I also learned asterisk first, so maybe that just made learning VoIP easier. I can't tell. But I do like using it more than I ever liked using asterisk. Um, it's really, free switch by itself is really terminal friendly. They have a lot of good design choices around that. Um, you certainly learn a lot about SIP and VoIP using it. So if you're into computing as a hobby, as I think most of us are, you'd probably have some fun working with this. If you're a guy that just wants your phones to work and you don't want to think about it a whole lot, it may not be the best choice. Um, there are some offshoot products, such as Fusion PBX, that uses free switch under the hood, and you have a nice web UI for adding your users and configuring your upstream telephony providers, et cetera. So my, my kind of logic is, if it's just you and a couple people, your house maybe, Free switch is great. You can configure it all in flat files uh, or a database if you really want to. Uh, if you have more than a dozen users, you might want something a little smarter with more like pointy clicky kind of stuff because you're going to be dealing with requests pretty often. But then if you get above maybe 50 users, you're probably going to be in the realm of configuration management and maybe you're doing load balancing and other smarter deployments. In which case, it kind of wraps around and free switch once again becomes the, the preferred choice with maybe a few other products around it. So the, the one you almost always see it with in big deployments, we're not going to get into it today, but just so you're aware, is a product called Camelio. Camaelio, I think. It's a, it's a Hawaiian word, but it's made in Italy, but it's a Hawaiian, I don't know. But uh, that, that's what you use for load balancing your VoIP systems traditionally. Alrighty, has anyone looked into any of the protocols concerning VoIP, like SIP or RTP or RTCP? Alrighty, so I'm gonna give a, a high level overview just so you guys get the gist of what's happening. I'll try to use some local metaphors to get the point across. Uh, all right, so the great thing about standards is there's so many to choose from. You can do anything you like. Uh, there's no singular VoIP protocol. That's just kind of describing a whole field of protocols. The ones that we're going to be talking about today primarily is SIP, the Session Initiation Protocol, SDP, the Session Description Protocol, and then the Real-Time Protocol, RTP, and the Real-Time Control Protocol, RTCP. And there's still all kinds of other stuff associated with these. Um, and equally important are the RFCs, which are, you know, they're close to standards, but they're more like a gentleman's agreement on how you're going to set things up, at least in the VoIP world. So that won't have a lot of bearing on what we're doing today because we're not doing anything overly complicated, but it's something you need to be aware of if you, if you go further in the field. 
Uh, so for instance, if you were designing a protocol to connect to your VoIP phones, how would you, how would you send button pushes when you dial like star six nine or something like this? Right? There's, there's a million ways to skin a cat. They figured out every single one and made an RFC for it. So in one instance, it sends the actual dual tone over the audio channel. Like that was, must have been like Rev1. Some things still use that. Uh, but there's also other SIP messages you can use that are like out of band signaling. Like it's a, a UDP message that says, hey, Troy pressed the one button, for instance. And then there's many different ways of sending that one message. So. Uh, you, you got to pay attention to that if you're setting up a PBX. If you're just kind of using a phone, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference to you. All right, so SIP, the session initiation protocol, <coughs> is exactly as it sounds, and it is exactly as vague. It is for setting up sessions of what? They don't specify. So you can do uh, video calls, you can do audio calls. You could even run your business on SIP in a weird metaphorical way. So let's say you're a local uh, systems admin and you accept your work bookings through the SIP protocol. So you might know a local sports fan and he really likes to dance and he wants to set up a blog about it. He might extend to you an invite to do some sysadmin services for him. And you think, dang, that's really cool. <coughs> I'm going to respond with a, an HTTP result code to the 200 series, because that's how people talk, because I think that sounds great. Naturally, he acknowledges you, and you begin your work. When you're completed the work, you tell him you're done with a, a curt message, and uh, presumably that ACK has some money associated with it somewhere down the line. This is all just a metaphor. So that, that's an example of setting up a session and it all worked and both parties communicated something. Now let's say a local washed up musician <laughs> is inviting you to, to create a dating site. He wants to meet American women and he wants to be the only result on the site. And you say, I'm kind of busy, Bert. I don't know about that. So you send a provisional response while you check your calendar because you're kind of humming and hawing over this and you want to respond to him pretty quickly. Eventually you realize you're too busy with the dancing blog. You don't have any time to make weird dating sites. So you give him a 400 error code and he acknowledges that. And that's the last you hear from Bert for a while. Now say a morally bankrupt fashion mogul <laughs> approaches you to, <laughs> to install some suspicious systems on a Bahamian island. That's broken Photoshop stuff. <laughs> Have you seen the original picture that that's inspired? <laughs> far cry, far cry. Uh, and you go, oh, let me, uh, I'm going to be a while. <laughs> I'm going to have to consult my, someone on this. And you, you come to realize that that is not an acceptable use of your skills. So you reply with a 600 series global error. Unacceptable here. Uh, which I thought was pretty funny. That is actually what the standard says, unacceptable here. You can respond with that way. And I don't know if he's the kind of guy that takes no for an answer, but in this instance he does, and that's the last you hear from him. So what we've covered, uh, there's a number of SIP message types, and I think this is almost all of the messages. Uh, we covered invite, ACK, buy, cancel. Um, register is what you use to authenticate most of the time. You have your options. Uh, provisional acknowledgement, I still don't know what the hell that's for. Um, subscribe, notify, publish, like pub sub kind of stuff. If you want to send some other events through the SIP protocol, you can do that. Uh, really, it's the top like five that, are, that you're going to see 90% of the time. And you don't really need to know these intimately, it's just nice to be aware of them. So those are the messages you can send, and the response codes are heavily inspired by HTTP. So 200 series success, 300 series redirection, uh, that, you just, that user's registered on this set proxy. Go talk to that guy, for instance. Uh, request error, server error, and global error. Curiously, you don't see a lot of global errors. I never really do. Everyone kind of keeps it in the, the 400 range. I think that's an RFC thing. I'm not too sure yet. So SIP is for setting up the session, but it doesn't actually tell you what the session is. 
that's where the session description protocol comes in. Um, in effect, the two are almost inseparable. You can't really use one without the other, but they are separate, separate sorts of things. <coughs> it's also used as a vehicle for negotiating on codecs. So sometimes you'll notice you you'll have a crystal clear audio call, and sometimes it'll sound like the 1980s called you. And the difference there is in the codec they use. And for instance, if it's going over the, the plain old telephone network, uh, and it's going down copper lines in like PCM format, that, that's in effect a codec. And that's why you're going to get some like audio quality drops there. But if you're on two like VoIP providers and they negotiate on a modern protocol like Opus, uh, you're going to have like crystal clear audio. So SDP itself doesn't provide the mechanism for negotiating codecs. That's covered by RFC 5939. And it's, I don't think there's a competing RFC for negotiating codecs, luckily. So that's pretty clear cut. Uh, so in keeping with our example, when the local dancing sports fan wants you to set up his web server, he'll send some key value pairs, in essence. And instead of a codec, say he's offering you payment options, uh, maybe hourly, salary, maybe you want some shares in his dancing blog, maybe you'll accept dancing as payment. Who knows, he's putting it out there. But you're a practical guy, so you then limit the options you respond back with to the ones that you want. Uh, and you're more a fan of the hourly rate. And then he simply acknowledges that, and then work can begin. So that's SIP and SDP. Uh, Real-time protocol is basically just send me an audio packet every 25 milliseconds, and things concerning transmitting audio packets. Uh, RTCP is the call metadata and link quality metrics. So there, there can be some metrics that tell you like, oh, your latency is this, or your call quality is perceived as this. Adjust your sample rate to that, that kind of thing. And these are UDP protocols. Um, in terms of audio processing, you're really focusing on latency and jitter. And for those reasons, you tend to avoid TCP for perform well, A, for network performance, and B, if you missed a packet, you don't really want to get it later anyways, because they already said the word. Like, you don't want the words coming in some, you, if you missed a syllable, you just move on. So they stick with UDP for that reason. Question, Question yes? Uh, mostly RTP, but I would say both is a fair, fair assessment, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, um, interestingly, even like ITSPs that I interface with at work, I'll use UDP for even the session setup. And that's mostly because there's retransmission mechanisms built into the protocol. You don't necessarily need TCP. So that's, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, so you can, uh, you can set up calls between your phone and another guy's phone directly. That's not very practical, however, uh, especially if you're behind uh, NAT devices and stuff like this. It gets really messy. So a lot of times uh, you'll use someone like less.net or voip.ms or flow route or signal wire, tons of providers to be your SIP proxy. So they live at a publicly routable address and your phone registers to their machine and then makes the calls on your behalf. And it works a lot like DNS, so it kind of passes the buck. If the user isn't there, oh, I know who does, and then you kind of do it that way. In summary, uh, well, I don't know if anyone would know SS Signaling System 7 more than SIP here, but SIP is the analog of out-of-band telephone communications. So when uh, Captain Crunch he was blowing his, that red whistle to get free phone calls. Yeah. They invented out-of-band messaging to circumvent that. And that's what SIP is in this instance. It's just the signaling that says, set up the call between this guy and that guy. And the audio actually takes a different, not necessarily different, but usually different network path. Um, if you are stuck behind a NAT and you are unlucky enough to have to debug audio problems, things you will 
be Googling for a while <laughs> are uh, ICE stun and turn servers that basically act as mechanisms to bypass, not bypass, but kind of traverse through NAT. So this is a, a real live trace of a call for Airbnb. Oh, it's not that exciting. But anyways, um, it just kind of shows the, the network flow that happens here. So we can see this is our edge device, and it's sending an invite to our proxy server, and that sends an invite to our PBX machine, and you can't see it on this network graph because it's actually going over a different interface. That then sends to a call center agent's phone. So you can see the invite happens, they say, oh, we're seeing if, that, if that's even a valid number. Hold on, please. And then it kind of passes the buck here. And they say, oh, OK, well, now I got to see if I have this user. And then there's a separate message for trying and a separate message for ringing, which is interesting. So you know when the other phone is actually ringing. And then the all good signal just goes back up the chain, and the acknowledgment comes all the way back. So it's a pretty simple network protocol. It just has some fiddly bits and how it gets set up sometimes. All right. Did we finish installing? We did. Look at that. Wow. Uh, all righty. So let's see. The first time I installed this, the service like crashed right after the install, which I thought was weird because it worked when I restarted it. So let's see what happens here. Failed. OK. You ever see that trick? <laughs> I learned that at Mug here. You can do uh, little command line replacements. Is this font big enough for the people in the back? Should I increase this size? Uh, probably a, a little bigger? Alrighty, let's, let's see if I can do that. Oh, that's not how you do it. There we go. How's that? Good. Alrighty. Hmm? Oh, I did a service restart. It uses system D, so I just issued like a system control restart free switch. And now it seems to be working. I don't know what its issue is, because that's just a bog default install. I'm not too sure. But it's, it's working now, so that's good enough for me. Alrighty. Some of the important bits of the installation. It is a rather large install. You saw it was just north of a gigabyte. Um, I think the most important is the log directory in var log free switch. Your configuration all lives in etc. free switch and it is gigantic. Luckily, we only have to focus on a few small parts today. Free switch by default uses SQLite under the hood and it'll store its database files in this folder here. You can configure it to use just about any database of your liking, however. Alrighty, so you would serve yourself well to make yourself part of the free switch group. So let's do that. Hey, gee, I always get this backwards every time. T Denton free switch. Oh, I didn't this time. Look at that. What? Or did I add free switch to the T Denton group? Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh my God. <laughs> You, you think you won. You really didn't. All righty. Well, <laughs> this thing is getting blown away anyways. I'm not going to fix that other one. That's fine. All righty. So if it all worked out, as my T. Denton user, I should be able to enter FSCLI. There we are. And it even has a handy-dandy advertisement right in the boot up to go to their conference. I think that's... <laughs> A little much, if I'm being honest, <laughs> but it is what it is. So this is literally just like a TCP connection uh, with a basic shell wrapped around it. And if you're using FreeSwitch outside of uh, Fusion PBX or similar bundled software, you will become intimately familiar with this little terminal. Uh, and oh, one important thing to note, it crashes sometimes, but that doesn't mean FreeSwitch crashed. And it'll scare you <laughs> a lot when that happens in production. You go, whoa, but no, it's still running. Just the weird shell crashed for some reason. So 
that's something to be mindful of. So FSCLI, that's, that's a, a very handy administrative tool. We're also going to install SNGREP. Has anyone used NGREP before? Network grep? It's pretty interesting. So this is, so <laughs> it obviously started with grep, then they made network grep, and then they made SIP network grep. So I expect that name to grow longer as the RFCs proceed, I guess. There's also TCP grep. Alrighty, and what this program does, let me just do something dangerous here. I usually run it in a screen session. Oh man, that's really hard to see. But it's all the SIP network traffic. This is my, my personal little VoIP PBX here. So you can see, like you get, you just get absolutely hammered with fraudulent, weird little calls. So you can actually like go in and take a look. This is the SIP messaging here. And then you could zoom in and you can see the actual invite at the top. Let me zoom this, see if I could zoom this in here. Could you repeat that? What's the persistency of this tool with that data? As long as you leave it running and you can configure the like buffer, I suppose. So it's all existed in the memory space you're talking about? I think so, yeah. You could probably, <laughs> you could probably type a packet capture into SN graph. Yeah, you can. Yeah. So you, if you were capturing your packets, you just have to replay it. You can also actually, I forget how to do it, but you can select a whole dialogue and then export a PCAP of it, which is super handy when you're debugging with another party and your calls aren't working. Uh, so you can see up at the top here, this is literally what gets sent over the wire for the SIP protocol. And this content like here down, that's the SDP, that's the session description protocol. So they are trying to set up an audio call Right here, this is their preferred codec here, PCM mu law at eight kilohertz. They are preferring to send telephone events uh, in this manner, like that's your dial tone pushes. And there's a whole bunch of other, these are like magic number constants that everyone magically agreed to use somehow. Um, and this is just some jerk trying to scam me, I don't know, but <laughs> that's, that's what an invite looks like anyways. And then you can, if I make an actual call here, let's see if I could zoom out a bit. Do you use less, are you? Sorry? Do you use less? Yeah, yeah, I do use less.net, yeah. I've also used VoIP.ms in the past for my personal stuff, but I like having a local guy I can yell at. That, that always helps, so. Let's see here. You know what? I'm just going to restart it because it's so full. <coughs> Come again? Yeah, yeah, you certainly could. Uh, I do do that as well. Let's just run it like this. I think if you leave SN grep running for like a month at a time, it gets confused sometimes. <laughs> okay, so now we can actually see the dialogue here and I'll push some buttons. Oh, I guess we're doing the inband. Uh, there, but you can see there when I hung up, it sent a buy message, and the invite is when it's set up, and the buy is when you when you hang up. 
Yeah, so that's that's what's handy about SN grip. It, it gets especially useful when you have multiple nodes participating, like in the Airbnb example I showed you earlier. Okay, so that's enough of that. Alrighty, so we did those two things. Uh, free switches main configuration file. You don't wind up editing this one so much because it's kind of boilerplate, but the main entry is freeswitch.xml that just has a ton of includes and those includes of includes and it's a whole mess. Uh, the main ones you're worried about are vars.xml and your autoload configs. That's how you configure the various modules and startup parameters. Um, because those are a little more static and vars.xml is concerning the core uh, soft switch part of the software. Dial plan is where your various calling logic lives. So for example, uh, if you want to be able to dial four digits to call your friend's extension, that sort of logic lives in a dial plan. The directory is where all your user account data lives by default. So you can store that in any kind of like LDAP or SQL database if you like. By default, it's a series of flat files that describe the username and password in plain text. And you would be very uh, remiss to leave those open to the internet because they get tried a lot. <laughs> so that's, that's the main layout. We'll dive a little deeper as we go here. So vars.xml holds what are called preprocessor variables which isn't a, a very common concept in configuration. But what it effectively means is if you're changing something in vars.xml, it's usually something that alters the fundamental operation of the daemon to the point where you have to restart it. If it's not in that file, you can usually just do a, a reload at runtime for that specific module. Uh, but vars will require a full restart in most instances. So the most important bit, let's, uh, let's start with this. Zoom in a little again. Sure. For whatever reason, the group doesn't have write permissions by <laughs> default on that guy. So let's dive right in. Uh, this one's interesting to read. It tells you in pretty plain language what you should do on the offset, which is basically like don't enable UPnP and change the default passwords or you're in for a world of hurt. So let's do that. <coughs> uh, whatever, there we go. Looks like a good password. I'll remember that. <coughs> and then these two parameters here, uh, external RTP IP, external SIP IP, are pretty important if you're operating this as a PBX behind a NAT device. In our instance, because it's in the cloud, I don't think it actually matters. It'll still work, um, but you could change these to your physical IP addresses. You know what, I'm gonna go ahead and do that because that's what I did on the example that worked. Mm -hmm. So, so let's try that. Actually, let's figure out what my IP is. <coughs> this is on Google Cloud Platform, so your IP changes after every reboot. Okay, uh, external RTP. There we go. External, yeah, that guy. There we go. So what we did is change the stun, stun.freeswitch.org, to a physical or a literal IP address. You can also use host names there, and I think for that you have to specify host if you're using a DNS name. 
Curiously, a lot of uh, configurations try to forego DNS as much as possible so that they're not doing a DNS resolve on every, every time they're trying to set up a call. So where practical, people tend to use actual static IPs. Alrighty, so the default domain uh, comes into play for your internal users. So wh what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up extension 1000 and extension 1001 so that they can call each other and eventually receive calls from less.net, for example. So you have to give them a domain for that. Um, if you don't, I don't have a DNS name for this guy, so it works just as well to use your actual IP address. Curiously though, on Google Cloud Platform, when it figures out your local IP address, it's an actual like unroutable 10.20, something like this. So I don't think that default configuration would work too well for you. So let's change that guy. What's that called? Domain equals. Yep, yeah, there we go. Alrighty. And then these two entries here, um, we're going to keep them the same. You'd be a little crazy to change them. The internal SIP port is 5060. That's very standard. That's for phones registering to your server, like your desk phone or your soft phone on your, uh, your mobile device. The external SIP port uses a different one. That's for incoming calls from your like less.net or other ITSP provider. You make, you make your domain the IP address? Is that because you don't have a hosted domain name? Yeah, in this instance, I used the IP because I don't have a, a registered domain name for this guy. So on my actual install, it does use the, the host right. name, and that's what most people would do. You can also multi-tenant stuff. I haven't done that a whole lot, but uh, it is possible, just a little more involved. Alrighty, so we already did the group permissions on free switch, and we're gonna, in essence, we're just gonna modify the default config it ships with and tune it up a little bit. Yeah, alrighty. I just want to see if we got it, if we get hammered with anything yet. Not yet. It seems to be like every couple minutes you'll get a couple hundred registrations out of the blue for all the default like 1,000 ad accounts. Someone might even be logged in right now for all I know. Let's let's check. Show registrations. Nope, okay, we're still good. So what I'm gonna do is stop free switch for a while, just so we don't have a gaping security hole. Every time, every time. Um, it wouldn't make a whole lot of difference right now because there's no configured gateway to dial out of. So even if they did log in, they would just be able to call other hackers who logged in. It wouldn't be very useful to anybody, so. It might be an interesting experiment, though, to set up someday. All right, where were we? Let's let's edit the directory. So you can take a look at default.xml. Really, all it's doing is including it's setting a bunch of default stuff and including the entire default directory right here. I can also draw your attention here to when it's doing these variable substitutions. One dollar sign is a normal variable. Two dollar signs is that vars.xml file, those uh, preprocessor variables. So that can be confusing. In fact, it is confusing, but it is what it is. Uh, anyways, we can descend into our directory here and see that they provided us with a bunch of accounts. I don't know who Brian is. He must be a pretty cool guy because he got his own name and everyone else got a numbers. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's just keep two accounts here.
Does anyone have a better way of delete all but these files? I always find this is faster than anything I cook up. I don't know. Zed shell has a negate uh, the blob trick, but I don't use Zed shell, so. Yeah. I don't know why Bash doesn't have it. A range would be more explicit than blob if you were paranoid about RMRFing stuff. Yeah. Alrighty, so we'll keep the, uh, the user ID the same, and that way all the existing dial plan logic will work out. Um, I don't think you want to see me spend hours in Vim, so I'll keep it as default as practical. So we'll change the password to uwinnipeg. I'm going to keep the VM pass, the voicemail password the same, because you have to punch that in on a phone, and that'd be a dick move to make it something you could not punch in on a phone. Okay. <laughs> we'll change the effective caller ID. So this one will be me. And the rest we can keep the same. We'll treat extension 1001 similarly. There we are. Cool, so. Oh, look at this, I'm learning. Remember the pseudo. So had FreeSwitch already been running and we changed the configuration, you can reload all your flat file configuration with the reload XML command, just like that. And does that affect, or would that affect any calls that are in place at the time, or that's only new sessions after that point? That is a great question. It wouldn't affect, it wouldn't affect calls in place. If your phone was registered with an account that then went away, there is a periodic registration that happens, and it has an implicit timeout uh, that you set. So what would happen is your registration would go stale and you wouldn't be able to, your phone would stop working, okay. in essence. All right, so let's try to place some calls. Let's see, let's see if it works. On my laptop, I've been using Linphone. I honestly do not like it one bit, but it is in the repos. All righty, now what, what was my IP? This is where having a host name would be really nice. So SIP identity works just like an email, user at host or domain as appropriate. Your SIP proxy address in our case, and in most cases is gonna be the exact same host. Um, it would be different if it were a multi-tenant system, for example. So you might have one big VoIP provider like less.net and he's hosting multiple domains, things like this. Um, to your earlier question, Wyatt, uh, the registration duration is how often it's gonna go and ping and update its registration. By default, this was set to an hour, and I'll go into why that sucks later on. <laughs> but uh, I've set it to 15 seconds, which is very short. Okay, and now it's prompting me for my password. So let's see if that registration worked. There we go. So it's in a very readable format, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of the time what I wind up doing in scripts or if I'm just trying to test the status of something, you can do fscli and pass the command you'd, write, you'd like to run. And then you can put it into your tool of your choosing. and get a nice list of all the users without all the cruft in there. 
Alrighty, so we got that one set up, and it would be very confusing if I had them both on the same laptop. I wouldn't know if it was working. So I will also set it up on my cell phone here. Uh, I wish I could share the screen on this. The, there, in Android, there's a built-in SIP thing you can do, but it'll drain your battery really quickly. Um, and it's also not very flexible either. Yes, in the back. Yeah, on my Pixel, it's not too great either. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've actually that's what I'm using here is a program called Zoiper. Zoiper on the desktop works beautifully. I'm still using the old free, the old version of the free one. You still have a free one, but I use the old version of the free one that allows for three accounts instead of one. Oh, okay. I use C six simple for my Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Whatever you like. <laughs> you could easily set it up over a VPN too. That's not something I've ever done, but if I were to actually rely on this service. Uh, yeah, depends. Yeah, it depends on a lot of things. Alrighty, so this should be my Dancing Gabe account. The configuration is very similar. Three five two two four seven one five. Would this be the most millennial thing to walk into? Like one guy on his phone in front of a whole room, and I'm just like, <laughs> I think it would. Alrighty, it says registering. It failed on me. Maybe the Wi-Fi wasn't working too great. Let's see. So which client are you using? Uh, I'm using Zoiper. Okay, you changed in 15 seconds. Yeah, by the way, that 15 seconds, if you were dealing with a white provider, they'll crucify you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially below three minutes. Two. You have to go below five or something. Yeah, it's usually in the order of minutes, yeah. uh, but I'm testing things and I tend to just lower it so I see results right away is, is my logic anyways. All right, so we can see there's the registration from Linphone. Let's see. Registration failed. Well, we might just have to bypass this part of the demo. That's a little frustrating. I did do that. I'm not, it's going to be something really simple. Well, anyways, the outcome of it is that you're able to dial other extensions. That's all it is. So on Linphone, I would be able to close this guy and dial 1001. So you can see it's sending the invite there, but there's no other phone registered to it because my phone's a jerk, or I'm bad at phones, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> But uh, usually that works. Uh, you'll just have to believe me. Alrighty, so with SNGrep running, we can take a look at some of the authentication that happens. You don't need to be intimately familiar with this. I just think it's kind of neat. So it sends the invite. Looks very similar to the scam one earlier. And that res responds with a specific proxy authentication required. And I think it sends, at that point, does it send a nonce, something like this? Where is that nonce? Oh, there it is, in the proxy authorization field. So it does its own little cryptographic song and dance that I honestly don't know a whole lot about. Uh, and it just kind of layers that on top of the SDP, or uh, the SIP protocol. 
And then when your uh, when your session's authenticated, you can then go and do your actual invite, and the call sets up when both your phones work. Okay, so at this point, we have maybe the worst possible installation of a PBX because it's open to the whole internet. Uh, if we keep this up for any longer, I'm sure we'll see just a flood of requests as people scan the internet. Uh, so let's move on and do something a little more interesting than calling phones that aren't working. Let's set up some inbound and outbound numbers via less.net. I haven't looked at what it costs to get an actual, like, physical landline lately, but last I checked, it was way more expensive than this. So this isn't sponsored by Les.net in any way. I don't think he's even the cheapest guy you could go with by long shot, but that's who I go with. Um, is, by the way, oh, sorry for interrupting. Um, I think it's still in place. Um, we do have a 10% uh, discount uh, from Les.net uh, for any VoIP or internet services, so if you're looking at buying something, let Les know that you're a Mug member and uh, he does have a discount code for you. I did not know that. <laughs> now you know. <laughs> I'm a director and I didn't know that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. It's difficult. You have to put in a special request sometimes three times to get the job done. Yeah, they are an office of, I think, three employees, so it can be slow sometimes. Um, yeah, so for instance here, when you, when you go through and you want to sign up for a number, you set up your account with them, which is a little archaic. You have to like send them photos of your ID or something, I don't know. But once that's set up, it works and you can just like buy numbers a la carte. You buy them and you can use them the next minute and you could shut them down and they're released back to the wild. The thing is, he gives you two numbers. Yeah, he gets them free. Yeah. Oh? So there's six, six, six. Yeah, Okay. You get a single free number of the 666 rate with your account. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and then each additional one, they give you the, the rate breakdown here. So you can either pay the flat rate, like 888 per month, if you make a lot of calls, or you can pay the $4, or sorry, $3 setup fee and pay by the minute if you're only going to use a couple minutes a month or something like this. Actually, that's confusing. Lesnet does it like most white providers. The uh, free is only for income, not for outgoing. Oh, okay, okay. Unlimited or, or at least a few thousand incoming minutes. They all, they all charge for the outgoing. Okay, sure. The outgoing is even related to a charge of the phone number. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <coughs> that makes sense. Uh, yeah, so you can order this one pretty easily. Uh, once you do that, you have to set up a SIP peer. So you order your number, that's all fine and well, but it needs to know where to send invites, SIP invites for that number. So that's where you set up your own SIP peer. So this is a screenshot of mine. Can I make a comment on that? Um, sure. Although ResNet is a very crude system, it's the rawest form of SIP you can find available commercially, and it's fantastic for learning SIP because there's a very sharp distinction between the TIDs, the phone numbers, and the peers. And uh, most other systems kind of hide that partially, whereas he exposes it completely. Oh, yeah. It's a fantastic tutorial system. <coughs> yeah, yeah. And I do kind of like it for that reason as well. You have, it, once you learn SIP, you come to appreciate all the options he extends to you, and you can troubleshoot things a lot easier, I find. Um, yeah, so for instance, this is, my main, the server I was showing earlier with the, the live cell phone call, and this is what I've set up for the mug demo. So it gives you some basic information, like which proxy he wants you to use specifically, uh, which, what IP reached out and registered to it, and some stats like the registration expiration time. So interestingly, just like how the phones register to your PBX periodically, it's the exact same thing for your PBX to the phone provider. It is nearly identical in operation. So uh, you associate your number with the SIP peer so that he knows where to send the call in, out of the whole internet. And he gives you, uh, yeah, so th this is the settings for the peer itself here. So the important bit is in red up top 
Um, I realize that it might be a bit small. You don't need to know the exact details because then you could steal my service. But uh, it tells you the SIP proxy you have to use, like where you send the register message to and where you get invites from. That's what the proxy is. And then there's a random username and password that you use to authenticate to that proxy to allow calls to flow. He also gives you a number of other interesting things. You can choose uh, the second option below the red box is the DTMF mode, so you can pick different ways to receive the button pushes if your server software is very inflexible about it. Uh, error method is interesting. It's set to verbal, so if you dial something that's invalid, there's actually a recording that it's Les's voice telling you that you screwed up. Not in those words, but uh, it sucks when you hear them. Um, he also has the codec support you can put in there. Uh, so he doesn't have Opus, at least to my knowledge, or that he exposes. Um, but those are some very popular ones. And then the rest of it, for the most part, will be populated with uh, information as your service uses it. The user actually has a username based upon your user ID and your peer number. So you have two numbers in the chat and you get a comp with your credentials and all users. Oh, okay. I didn't notice that. <laughs> Yes, in the back. Um, unless you're trying to use this peer for inbound only, you really do need to fill in both the outbound caller ID and the caller ID name. You can pass that along in your SIP uh, STP. Only the name. I've passed. You know what? I haven't tested it a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, that might be the case. Yeah. So this is there more if your if your uh, SIP client is taking a care care report and have less. That's correct, yeah. So, like, and it's important to note, too, with less.net, you could just point, like, your desk phone at his servers. And he has means for that. I'm going, like, the full, like, deep dive on how you can set up a, your own PBX to use it. But he is flexible in, in his options. Um, so what I was mentioning earlier, uh, the registration looks a lot like this. You send a register uh, from your free switch instance to the proxy that Les told you to send it to. It sends back a 400 series error. It's basically solve this riddle if you want to make a phone call. It's like a cryptographic whatever. Uh, so you send the answer back, and then you're good to send your invite after that point. And curiously, not curiously, by design, uh, your phone registering to your free switch box does the exact same protocol. And this mess is what a phone call looks like coming from the outside world. So this would be from the actual telephone network or from a SIP peer that Les has. And one thing to notice is every step along the way, it sends an invite, and then it gets a 100 trying, and then like a ringing later sort of thing. So LesNet is the first proxy it hits in effect. And then it says, all right, I'm trying. And then this guy doesn't need to know that he's contacting your server. And then Les doesn't need to know that your server's contacting your phone. And then it comes all the way back to set up the call. Um, in Les's instance, I yeah, I believe all the media does flow through his proxies. That doesn't always have to be the case, but it usually is for your uh, ITSP media. Alrighty, so to actually configure that with, with uh, free switch with Les.net, we're going to take a look in the SIP profiles directory. So there's some unusable defaults there. Uh, you'll notice internal has its own, has one file, external is a whole directory. So normally you only have one like SIP interface, only one interface locally that your phones are going to register to. But you can have multiple gateways. You could have multiple numbers with less. For example, if you wanted to call from a Manitoba number one day and Alberta number the next, or you could even use different SIP providers entirely and route these calls out VoIP.ms and route these calls through less.net, Any, anything you like. So we'll go into external here. Uh, let's see what's in the example. I, we really don't need that. And let's see. Let's 
going to transfer a working example file here to the correct server. There we are. Okay. So the configuration is pretty basic. Uh, we just put in the values he gave us on the SIP peer page, and we can add our own expire seconds in there. Uh, 360, I guess, is six minutes. That was, you could actually up that quite a bit if you're not behind any NAT devices. Doesn't really matter at the end of the day. I'll, I'll keep it the same for now because that's what worked. So now, what I'm going to do first is actually block registrations by IP tables just in case someone gets in and then does try to make a phone call because that can get really hairy. Can anyone actually like remember IP table syntax like ever? Yeah, most of it. Really? Some of it. I, I get everything in the wrong order every time and then <laughs> I gotta look it up. We can do it for 20 years. <laughs> that looks about right. And I'll do this TCP counterpart. Does your uh, <coughs> system use uh, firewall D, mm. but uh, I think you're on a Debian system. Red Hat uses firewall D. I don't think it uses firewall D, unless it's done some bait and switch and I haven't noticed, but. Uh, you can check to see if you have a command called firewall dash CMD. Nope. No firewall D. Doesn't look like it, so yeah. Okay. So, uh, Alrighty, so uh, new profiles can be loaded at runtime. Uh, so part of the never-ending confusion of running free switch in general is uh, Sophia is the name of its SIP stack. I have not figured out why. So I don't know why the SIP stack's named Sophia. I don't know why their conference is called ClueCon. They just are, and you learn it, and that's all it is. So you do... There we go. You can see added gateway less.net to profile external. Uh, I can zoom that in a bit here. Registering less.net. Yeah, so that's working there. And actually, now that I think about it, I should stop free switch on this server or it's going to get really confused because I use the same account on both. There we are. Okay, now, actually let's fire up SN grep the right way. And let's, uh, let's give it a call and make sure our less.net registration worked out. So that's 204666, which I love, 8876. Yep, there we go. So I didn't answer the call or do anything meaningful with it. So SNGREP will show it as it responded with busy because there was no dial plan there to handle that number and route the call. So yeah, we have connectivity coming from less.net. That's fine and dandy. We should route it to our phone. All 
All right, so worth noting that the external profiles operate on port 5080. That's what less.net is going to send to your server. And the internal profiles operate on 5060. Just something interesting to keep in mind. Alrighty, when a call comes in, it's routed according to the dial plan, which is yet another XML configuration file. So I've pre-prepared one that we can plop in place. Whoa, what the hell is this? Oh, that's me registering to less.net. That's what that is. <laughs> See that big username in the sip from column? I'm like, that's, that's not a common username. Some, someone's a really bad hacker, but that's not the case. That's just, that's just my gateway registering itself. Okay, so let's get it out of this guy. There's a dial plan public. There we are. So let's remove that default one. Yeah, we don't need that. And for it to actually load, we have to move it to a .xml file. Alrighty, so. For now, let's just make the VoIP phone on my laptop run. So the logic here, is this font size still okay? I know I've been moving it around a bit, my apologies. SN grep is kind of hard when it's really zoomed in. Uh, so the extension name, every like stanza in free switch configuration is known as an extension. Um, the name doesn't actually matter so much, so long as you're consistent. And basically, when a call comes in, it goes through all of your XML, like, top to bottom, and it's like a first matching basis. So we can see this condition clause here. Now, because you could have an inbound number uh, that's just about anything, we want to match on the inbound number that matches the one we registered. So that's 204-666-8876. So if it matches that, it then executes the actions in that block. So in this instance, it transfers the call to extension 1000 in the XML dial plan under the default domain. So we plunk that in. And it was just an XML change, so we can just execute reload XML like that. And now, with any luck, when I dial that number, it'll forward to my laptop. Pray to the, the gods of live demos for me, please. Hmm. Let's see, I got the message, but that didn't really pan out the way I thought it would. Do you want to try calling my last match number to see if you succeed in getting through? Uh, I think I'm okay without that. Okay. Thank well, you. Get through, you'll get fax squeals out of that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can do without the fax squeals, yeah. Thank you for the offer, though. Let's see.
Let's see. So I'm searching for work because that's what came in on my caller ID. So that was a configuration I used. Uh... Huh, okay. I wonder if my other server is actually running here. <coughs> All right, no, you know what? I won't spend too long troubleshooting this. I hate to put you guys through it. When I call that number, I got a whole bunch of output here that tells me that it's just my dial plan that isn't doing what I think it is. Show registrations. Hmm. Alrighty, well, oh. Oh, I'm really dumb. I know exactly what I did. I know exactly what I did, and I think Wyatt does too. I blocked all incoming registrations so I wouldn't get hacked. <laughs> so that my phone stopped working. That's, that takes a special sort of stupid. Okay. That's really funny. No, I'm far too lazy for that, my friend. Drop the shields. Just use dash capital F. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Eh, good enough. Alrighty. <laughs> In other news, never let me on your production servers. <laughs> on your life. Don't, never do it. Okay, now let's show registrations. There we go. Now let's call the number. There we go, incoming call. That's all I wanted. That's all I wanted. Let's see if you guys can... Hello? Hello? That's how you know it's working. <laughs> Alrighty, so that's how you get a call routing to one extension. Now, if we want to make a outbound call, the configuration looks very similar, and this is no longer in the SIP profile. Or sorry, it's no longer in the external dial plan. This is in the default dial plan. And the curious bit here that I really like about FreeSwitch and probably everyone else hates is that it uses Perl regular expressions for like everything. It makes no, they, used to, they chose XML and Perl for all their configurations. So. When an outbound call, like when I place a call from Linphone here, it'll come to this thing, it'll see the destination number, and it'll match 10 digits. And it's actually using the brackets here as a Perl capture group to then forward that call out to my Sophia SIP gateway, the less.net gateway, and then the dial to number in that instance. So Perl's, Perl's still strong in the telecom industry. Mm -hmm against everyone's best efforts. <laughs> so let's get that in place. Survivor. Five more minutes? Five more minutes? Yeah. Oh, okay. You know what? Uh, I'll bypass a bunch of the individual setup steps and maybe I'll just move it along to the, yeah. the yeah. final most useful thing uh, based, based on it here. All right, so different dial plan destinations, you should know. The external dial plan is known as public, and the internal one is known as, well, the, the default one's called default. You can make multiple dial plans. Um, but it's important to separate them because you don't want someone calling in and then able to call back out and like use your outbound rates. Mm -hmm. That would be very expensive very quickly. So that's why they're separated. Uh, some very common gotchas when you're running free switch. Um, there's always this fundamental like race condition if you're behind NAT with your SIP registrations. So if your SIP registration, for instance, is default an hour, 
but your router has forgotten about your um, that NAT state, that routing state, you're not going to get calls routed to you. And it's really painful to figure that out the first 10 times, and then you remember it. And then that's why you see when I'm testing, it's down to 60, 15 seconds or something on the registration. Yes, in the back. Is one common router in use in Winnipeg that everyone should be warned about? It's the cheapest one that Shaw has for the real world plan. That's the Cisco GPC3825. It has a completely screwed up NAT implementation. It can't hold you for a minute or two properly. Oh, wow. Do not do void with that router. Good to know. Good to know. Uh, some other very common gotchas, uh, especially with less.net. Uh, the dialing pattern is set on your SIP here. So sometimes you have to do 10-digit dialing. Sometimes you have to do 11-digit dialing. You can enable 7-digit dialing if you want to feel like it's 2001 again. Um, but you just have to be mindful of that. Otherwise, you're going to get an error message if you dial an invalid pattern. Um, I don't think 7-digit would work because they have 204 in front of them now. It works because they'll put 204 in front of it for you. Yeah, that you want to dial 4 through one number, though. Well, yeah, you lose it. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure how that works out because I don't use it. It's a legacy. It's probably removed. Yeah. Okay, so uh, dialing, dialing plans aside, uh, another very common problem if you have one way or no audio, uh, that's usually a NAT traversal problem and you'll want to take a look into ICE, STUN, or TURN servers. Alrighty, uh, let's install the bare necessities for uh, IVR, so like text-to-speech. It's a package called F-Lite. I only know about it because of its application for text-to-speech in FreeSwitch. And then let's load that module. Load, whoop. Load mod F-Lite. There we go. Update our dial plan. Uh, we don't need to make the basic IVR. Let's just go right to the useful bit the number forwarding service. And what I can actually do is switch to the other server that it's already working on. And I never learn, and I never learn. There we go, so that'll come online with the same configurations. There we go. So what we have here is a really basic application. Uh, at my work, for whatever reason, we work in telephones, but I don't have a work phone at all. They expect me to put my actual cell phone number in all my emails. So what I did is I just registered a less.net number. I put that in my profile, and when people call that, it comes to my dial plan here. So, I'll zoom this in here. Yeah, you can do that as well. He does have that service. Uh, I don't know if you can do time of day routing. That's what I like about doing this and other like complex stuff. So in this instance, if you dial the number and it's between weekdays 2 and 6, so Monday to Friday, and it's hours 9 through 18, so regular working hours, it'll forward the call to the call forward extension, which is down here. And it plays a little message, now calling Troy, hold please. It sets the effective caller ID, so it shows up on your phone as saying work. Like, and it prepends that to the caller ID that the call came in on. So I can see what number is calling me, but I can also see it, it's coming from work, so I shouldn't answer it. Um, and then you could set the caller ID number as well. 
And then you simply tell it to bridge the call to your external gateway, and then it'll call right to my cell phone. One thing that took me a long time to figure out, you have to answer the call first before you go. <laughs> like, it'll still work. It'll send audio. It's called early audio. Uh, but less.net, after a certain amount of time of you not sending the answered signal, he'll go, who is this joker trying to like talk to people for free? And he'll stop the call on you. So <laughs> I learned that by fiddling way too long. Um, yeah, so between 9 and, f 9 and 6, I guess, it'll transfer to my cell phone. But we also see the anti-action up here, <coughs> where if it's not between that, it forwards to a piece of logic called my IVR. So let's, now it's well past six now. Let's see what happens when we call it. Uh, I don't know if you guys will be able to hear this or not. And I'll have to call from this guy. <laughs> I press one to hear a secret message. Press two to call Telemus. <laughs> but there's other options in there too. If you press two, it forwards the call to Telebus, just as an example, <laughs> and you could get their your current stop numbers and. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I, I gotta get the plug for Telebus. I've often used it in while testing VoIP because because uh, it has voice recognition. So you just say a stop number to it, and that's an indication of whether something can hear you on the other end of the call. That's a really good idea, actually. Yeah, I never. Favorite test number of mine. I just like it because it automatically answers, and then I know it worked. <laughs> yeah, so. it automatically answers, and it's got a machine I can I can speak to that will speak back to me what I said. Nice, nice. I'm gonna keep that in my back pocket. So that's that's what I use it for. Uh, you could do some other cool ideas. You could support SMS. So you could text your server and say, call me because I don't want to talk to this person right now. And then you'd get a call that you could pick up. Uh, what, I've, what I'm hoping to do at some point for our support department is set up an IVR for troubleshooting common problems. Like press one if you already restarted this service and enter the like con confirmation code <laughs> so that because I get support calls from the Philippines and they're brutal um, because mostly because of the time difference um, you could automate or streamline your maintenance call out procedures or even with less.net you can register a 1-800 number a 1-866 number and make yourself look like a legitimate business um, it does wonders to impress people one time there was a I couldn't get a data sheet for a certain chip until I signed an NDA and they wouldn't let just regular Joe Blow sign an NDA. So I made the most basic website and 1 800 number so I looked like a company. And they called it, and then I got to sign the NDA. So. <laughs> and that only cost a couple dollars. It's, it's really cheap. So that's all I had for you today. I hope you took something away from this, and feel free to, to pick my brain before you leave here today. Thank you for having me. Cool.